I think we missed the 90s Yeltsin Russia. I think that's the Russia that America wants. And I think that's the Russia that America is trying to create through this proxy war. And what was that Russia? That Russia was, <laughs> if you can remember it, that was the Russia. All the graduate students almost en masse ran away from Russian studies because all their advisors were telling them, look, Russia's an also ran now. It's a total democratic, corruptive, klepto kleptocratic mafia state. It's not important on the world stage. It won't be for a long time. Uh, it's totally inept. They're our friend, but they're friend in the sense that they know that, that they need us, the Americans. The Russians need the Americans, they need our money, they need our aid, and they will do what we tell them to do. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, again here with Dr. Matthew Croston. Um, I'm going to show you now the second part of the interview that we did yesterday, in which uh, Dr. Croston tries to uh, figure out what the goal of the United States could be in this ongoing proxy war in Ukraine. And again, that original, that original topic, when you are the invading force, it is obvious that and this small country just to the west of Russia has such a strong backer in, <laughs> in the United States, in NATO, in many, many other Western European countries, that it, it's just, it's distasteful to them to think any kind of negotiation that might involve any kind of loss of Ukrainian, further loss of Ukrainian territory is just not acceptable. Why? Because again, Russia invaded and it's their fault, so they should be punished. And there's aspects of this that we're talking about. I was having a conversation the other day with someone and they had mentioned something I'd never really thought of it in this way, is that they just sort of shook their head at one point and they said, this is just such a surreal, almost it seems fake war. And I'm like, well, clearly people are dying in this destruction. So how is it fake? And they were like, no, no, it's like, I can't think of a war, certainly not in the modern age, where the president of the invaded country goes on this kind of weird, cringe, yeah. the worldwide media tour. And he's like hugging the prime minister of, of, of the UK. He's, he's actually addressing Congress in the United States in these countries while his country is actually defending itself in a war against Russia. And then just think about what was hilarious to me um, a couple of weeks ago when Biden did mm. his, his secret visit to Kiev. The brave visit. When, when was the last two things? When was the last time we've seen a sitting United States president literally just sort of secretly without a lot of fanfare suddenly appear in the middle of a supposedly invaded country? <laughs> Yalta. Yeah. <laughs> Yalta. But, On Crimea, 1945. But it, right. But it was amazing to me to then find out afterwards that, and this is where the surreal point really struck home for me, is that Many and it, it, this got horribly underreported in the United States, probably because it sort of it bucked up against the narrative of what a brave leader the United States has to make this risk to show his his camaraderie and show his collegial collegiality with Ukraine. Is the United States communicated about the trip to the Kremlin? <laughs> Sorry, my world's coming down. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Sorry, the United States communicated to the Kremlin that. This flight will be happening. This is where it will go. It's going to land in Kiev. It is President Biden. And it's like, so you told the enemy exactly where the leader of the free world is going and going to be. But why did they do that? They did that because they wanted to make sure Russia would understand and would respect Biden's desire to go see Zelensky. And they let it, and they let it happen. Of course. I mean, because, but then again, what are the Russians going to do? Shoot down Air Force One, kill the president of the United States and have nuclear war? Of course not. It's, it's, but it's still restraint. Yeah, it, right? it is restraint. It's it is restraint. It's uncapitalized, but, it's uncapitalized but, restraint. That's why I think it is 100% evident by now that we are back in the 19th century where war is the extension of politics by other means. Um, so. We are we are doing politics here by killing people Klaus. on both sides. <laughs> we are back. Well, this is right. because the Kremlin is still connect. I mean, Moscow is still talking to Washington, but they're not doing what what each other want, and then they're fighting it out. And this is this is um, this is horrible. Uh, but like it, 
there's a cynical part of me. There's a cyn- I have to say, there's a cynical part of me that has almost been, I wouldn't be shocked if, if 50 years from now when the classified documents and classified communiques become declassified, we find out there have always been conversations between DC and the Kremlin where they're almost sort of admitting, listen, we know in the end you're going to have a few extra territories out of Ukraine, and but we've sort of lost control of Zelensky because he's a worldwide media star now and he won't be quiet and he won't consider going to the negotiating table because he actually is convinced himself he's capable of physically defeating you and outlasting you with our assistance, of course. And if the Americans are being honest, they would also say, and, and to be totally truthful, as long as it doesn't escalate to a higher level, it's just really been too much fun this last year killing all you Russians and not taking any consequences. That's very cynical. Just for everybody to understand, Matthew means this in the most cynical of all ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, this is why I say, where, where does the cynicism come from? Just uh, last week, two weeks ago, I uh, was reading an article or an interview with uh, with General, I think it's Ben Hodges, I might have his first name wrong, but General mm-hmm. Hodges, who's a former commander of U.S. forces yeah. in Europe. And he was talking about how, and you could almost read, read through the lines and feel how thirstily he was saying a total Russian collapse is close. Yeah. And he was speaking yeah. of that not as, not as this would be a terrible thing, this would cause chaos on the world stage that would extend its tentacles out into so many different areas. But it was almost like this, this would be great. This would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. We want this. And I'm like, what other country are we sitting in? We didn't have that reaction. We walked away from Afghanistan after 20 years. And literally within a week, the Taliban were back in place in power. And instead of making it sort of be seen as a defeat on our part, we actually had many, many analysts talk about, well, some kind of governance in Afghanistan is better than total anarchy and letting the place collapse, which is what the alternative would be if we don't let the Taliban take over and we leave. It'll just be total anarchy. So that's a bad thing, but it's okay to let the 130, 125 million people of Russia collapse. Like this is where when you ask, when you try to ask Russians, like where does their cynicism come from? Or where do their quote unquote conspiracy theories come from? Their conspiracies come from comments like that. When they have someone who is of deep respect, General Hodges, openly talking about how it wouldn't be such a bad thing if there's a total Russian collapse. I kind of look forward to it. <laughs> so this is not about protecting Ukraine. It's about making sure we collapse. Yeah, that's why that's why I believe that people in Russia do believe that they are under serious threat. Um, that if There's... if given the opportunity, this is what the West would actually wish. What the West wishes on Russia at the moment in all its in all its hatred. Right, and there's we. T- I remember there was a point in our conversation a year ago where I talked about how what is particularly galling and frustrating for for Russian military and Russian diplom- diplomats, Russian intelligence officers, that they feel, listen, we, it's okay if you don't want to be friends with us. So there's, there's so much psychic damage between the United States and the, and the Russian Federation because of the Cold War that we're never going to be best friends. We get it. We get it. It's okay. But there's this neighbor not far from us called China, and you don't get along with, with them all the time. And you certainly don't believe in everything that they do. And you certainly don't share all of China's interests. But you also work with them on a whole host of issues where there are commonalities and there's opportunities for collaboration and cooperation. Why can't you just do that way with us? And then we just had in 2021, Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, literally said this about China on a microphone in front of an international audience. Our relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. He just defined in that one sentence all that Russia has ever wanted with the United States for the entire 21st century. And we have not even come close to giving it to Russia, but we will openly just unprompted in front of a microphone say that's exactly how we are with China. That is what drives Russians absolutely insane. 
I, I I remember I remember that we went there a year ago. I'm not entirely sure anymore if that's the motivation, but the um there's definitely something. But let's also not forget the European factor. I mean, nothing right. has been better for transatlantic relationship and really gluing those um I look at them at the moment as satellites, you know, the European satellites to the to the US heartland than mm. this confrontation with Russia. And that has since since the end of the Second World War, that has been the case. The more adversarial the the relationship got, the closer the the ties between the satellites and and and, and the heartland. And if you look at the moment, what this con what this conflict also did, you know, the Nord Stream pipeline. And I think you have to be pretty pretty blind to to not see the writing on the wall. And you know, the the Hirsch story. I just buy that. I buy that. This is what makes the most sense. I'm, I'm sorry. This is probably probably what's going to come out in the end as as true. Um, that it was, uh, you know, this was an an attack on allies. So you know that. Right. Well, yeah, but it, it's that that sort of twist. You know, your map is not cooperating with you. Yeah, no, no, that all. It's been really. There's a yes. twist. It was funny how the Nord Stream pipeline detonation has actually been fascinating to me because. I feel like I'm the only one in the United States that remembers when it first happened, about three weeks afterwards. The United States admitted, publicly admitted, that it was a, a it was basically a special forces CIA operation. And now, now it's saying it was probably conducted by Ukrainian <laughs> Ukrainian specialists. And the point I'm like, what makes it funny to me is simply the fact that. Russians don't care because they see those as the same team anyway. So then they don't really care who specifically like planted, went underwater and planted the detonation materials, the explosives. That I mean, whether it was CIA or American military or Ukrainian special forces or Polish operatives, for all we know, for the Russians in this in, in the Russians in this war, that's all. The, that's yeah. all the same. Yeah, but you know, even. That's that still leaves us at the same point where we are now in a in a in a world where you know among allies you blow up each other's critical infrastructure in know. order in order no, to I galvanize mean... the alliance. That's you know this is very reminiscent to what Warsaw Pact did whenever one of its members kind of had a different idea and tried to wiggle out right. your Hungary fifty six uh, Czechoslovakia in sixty eight. You know these alliances are actually well, also dangerous to themselves when members don't exactly want to cooperate. So if I was Viktor Orban right. in Hungary, I would be quite worried. Um, uh, also, Turkey is on the, um, we'll have to watch out what it's doing, although Turkey is in a very strong position. What's what's most unfortunate to me in that, is, and because, listen, it's okay to just be against Russia in this war. <laughs> But what I what I despise is the lack of quality analysis and conversation. Yes. Right. You just said with the Nord Stream pipeline, that's not just an act to hurt Russia. That was an act that actually hurt many important countries in Western Europe. Yes. And and the fact that we really don't have that conversation at all. Yeah. Is means that that's that's to the detriment of everyone. It and, is. And the the less quality conversation we have the more likely the the insanity of the conflict continues and that's that's i i believe how you know that uh, you know the west is an integ an integral part of the war because the war propaganda from our own part is also dripping in on the on the general population we are inside the war bubble and the war mentality bubble and that's what makes everything so difficult to to mm. to then analyze and you know you also talked about this before i mean we have this strange m moment again although every war has this we know this from 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 uh, um, academic scholarship that you have moments when the hawks in the U.S. and the hawks in Moscow and the hawks in Ukraine actually work together in order to create the conflagration they want. You know, everybody wants oh, yeah. people who want to fight. They start cooperating uh, across nations um, for opposite ends, but they won the war, right? And they got their war. And the doves on each side they get like suppressed by their own. Uh, leaderships like because the, the they oppose the, the the war narrative and we are caught in that again 
where the the peace movement in the US, the peace movement in Europe and, and the ones in Russia are being suppressed by their own media and so on. And the, the hawks are collaborating to keep dragging on the war and try to win final victory. Yeah, I, I, any kind of grandiose statements like that always just make me shake my head because I, I think both of us knew even when it first started, it was highly unlikely any side in this was going to have a quote unquote grand victory of yes. any kind yes. that could be identified as a grand victory. That was that to me was evident on day one. So the idea that here we are on day whatever 385, 400, that we still aren't willing to engage real talks about negotiation. Yeah. Like this was always fated to go to negotiation. That yeah. that is always where it was going to go. And the longer we just put that off, the more people die for nothing. And it is fated to end in a, in some form of neutrality agreement for this for this in between land because that's that's the no brainer from the beginning where everybody like everybody understands that there needs to be some form some form of buffer zone, and um, I don't understand how we didn't get there. My best guess at the moment is that we really had the, these hawkish collaboration across nations that then wanted a mm. war to happen. Uh, because the no-brainer to end this is through some form of neutrality agreement. I think I agree with that completely, but I do believe that's the one area where perhaps the, unfortunately, the 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 horribly poor performance, the horribly horribly poor uh, preparation of Russian military forces, that that really, quite frankly, caught everyone off guard, including the Russian military hierarchy. Um, but even the Americans themselves, I think, didn't expect them to perform this unevenly. Uh, I, like I said, I, I, I'll. It'll be hard to move me off the position that the Americans' original position was: uh, this will probably go about six months, uh, and then it will just run out of steam in the sense that the Ukrainians won't have anything left really to fight. Yeah. And then we'll have to go to the negotiating table and we'll we'll try to work this out. And the fact that it didn't, it then we started to see after that six month point, that's when I started to see more and more. I mean, there really isn't any other way to put it. It's just sort of sort of verbal bloodthirstiness at the yeah. idea of, hey, the Russians aren't, they don't seem that eager to formally make this a war with America, like formally. So, but they're also not trying to demand on the international stage any definitive international action to stop all that lethal aid coming into Ukraine. So the Americans are like, well, if they're not going to try and stop that and they're not going to attack us directly, I'm, we're just going to keep killing Russians <laughs> because that 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 works in our interest. We we yeah, and we think and that's the, our and in the process, sacrifice all the Ukrainians. It's like that's why I. Well, I understand There's, why the Ukrainians want to fight, but I don't understand why you would want to encourage them to do that over trying to have some form of live, uh, workable agreement. Um, because at the end of the day, people need a house, they need food, and they need they they they, they need a, a place to sleep. Uh, if you can the, provide the that in some form, you get to a more humane uh, environment. The Ukrainians and all of this have have really sort of swept on a pendulum for for many years now of sort of like sort of just tennis manipulation, right? Mm. <laughs> Promising one thing, then the other side promises this better, and then they, they just, which side, which side? And and there's sort of an analogy that we talk about sometimes saying, but, but what do the Ukrainians want? And if you're really, really vicious about it, the reality is they say, listen, in a proxy war, Ukrainians, they're the fuel. You understand? They're the gasoline. And nobody asks the gasoline where the car is going. You understand? The car doesn't get driven by the gasoline. Yeah. So if you really want to know where this goes or how this ends, you ask you, I'm sorry, but you ask the Americans. And and so far that really hasn't happened. The Americans have actually tried to say it's not our decision. Because again, why? Because they invaded. <laughs> it's yeah. not our fault. They invaded. So yeah. it's on them. Yeah. But and I know we're probably up against it on time, but I did want to say one thing, uh, sort of in in closing was that. This has never popped into my head, but it's I sort of just happened this past weekend when I was walking around and it suddenly dawned on me. It's like, you know what? What is it that we want? Like, because that's the one thing the Russians honestly mm -hmm. don't know. What to ask them is like, what do you think the Americans want if it's not, quote unquote, the total collapse and destruction of Russia? Like, mm -hmm. let's take 
that ground zero off the table. What do you think they want? And they, they never know. They really can't think of anything. And it suddenly dawned on me that I don't think maybe I've, I've written a lot about this and I think maybe I'm wrong is that I don't think we're pining, even the military industrial complex. I don't think we're missing or pining for the cold war. I don't think we want, we want to see Putin as a Lenin or a Stalin or a Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table. Heck, I don't even think we want to see him as a Brezhnev completely honest, but I think what we miss, I think we miss that old guy, that old guy missing a few fingers who, I think we miss the nineties Yeltsin in Russia. I think that's the Russia that America wants. And I think that's the Russia that America is trying to create through this proxy war. And what was that Russia? That Russia was, if you can remember it, that was the Russian, all the graduate students almost en masse ran away from Russian studies because all their advisors were telling them, look, Russia's an also ran now. It's a total democratic, corruptive, kleptocratic mafia state. It's not important on the world stage. It won't be for a long time. Uh, it's totally inept. They're our friend, but they're friend in the sense that they know that, that they need us, the Americans. The Russians need the Americans. They need our money. They need our aid. And they will do what we tell them to do. That's almost like sort of been forgotten, I think, sometimes in the sense of how the Russians view the 90s in retrospect. That was the Russia, for example, that Putin inherited yeah. when he became president on, on January 1st, 2000. It was that Russia when that the famous quote of Putin that always gets blasted still to this day all over the West. And I've argued from day one that this is horribly misinterpreted and, and pushes people to not understand who Putin is as a leader and as a strategist. When he made that famous comment about the collapse of the Soviet Union was the, the biggest, most colossal mistake of the 20th century. And everyone has, everyone has turned that comment into, see, see, he just wants to be Stalin. He just mm -hmm. wants to reinvent the Soviet Union. But what he really meant all along was that you guys just don't remember or you never appreciated what my country was when I inherited it as president. On How June hurtful this was. How many people were suffering and suiciding and dying of uh, of all preventable right. cause of there disease. There was that in the in the nineties. There was that phase, and you don't if you're not a you don't have to be a demographic population expert to understand this. Every year for five straight years, male life expectancy in Russia went down, oh, and gosh. that's nearly impossible. <laughs> like mm. like that statistically quantitatively nearly impossible and russia did it i remember because in the late 90s i was a young doctoral student and i actually had uh doctoral advisors mentors tell me that you probably shouldn't you probably shouldn't focus on russia because honestly honestly matthew hell i don't even know if in a generation russia's even going to exist anymore like it just might not be there given the trends of the 90s yeah right? yeah and so what's disturbing to me is when you say to the Russians, what do the Americans want from this war in Ukraine? They might say, well, I actually want to get Russia back to Yeltsin 90s. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the worst possible outcome. I have one more and that's Jimmy Dore's analysis. And that's the, that the, um, the military industrial complex in, in, in the US is so strong that it manages to create these forever wars anywhere and war itself, just the fact of burning through ammunition, burning through <laughs> rockets in order to sell more, that this process is capturing, it, it has captured the political process and that war itself becomes the goal. And as soon as you switch off one, like Afghanistan, you have to switch on another one. Uh, and you have to go from one to one in order to keep feeding the the war machine. That that was right. the name of the rally, right? That there was in Washington two weeks ago, uh, rally against the war machine. And that's the analysis from those guys. Uh, if your analysis is correct, there would at least be a goal. You would at least know where um, <laughs> that that in your analysis, war is a means to achieve something. In their analysis, war itself is the is the goal. Well, I mean, and, and the funny thing is, maybe not funny. That's probably not the right word. My apologies. Is that we're talking about two two groups of actors that have goals that are different but can still run parallel with each other moving forward, right? I, I may think that there's some hawkish people in the political corridors of power 
who would love to see a return to 90s Yeltsin Russia mm-hmm. because make Russia irrelevant and, and dependent, quite frankly, on Western aid and advice. But the military industrial complex, I mean, of course, they've been extremely happy because they've like almost emptied the coffers to supply yeah. the equipment for this war. But they know they live in an environment in the United States that will say they'll go to Congress on K Street, where all the lobbyists are, and say, listen, we're, we now have to go back to protecting America. Well, how do we protect America? We protect America by you guys, Congress, funding us in budget allocations to replenish all of the weapon yeah. systems that we've given to Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, because because you have, I mean, the United States has these grave, grave, grave security threats in the forms of balloons that go over your country. <laughs> I mean, this is so dangerous. Yeah. You need a couple of more uh, hundreds of billions of uh, missiles to shoot them down. Well, now, you, now your cynicism is showing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was that's just it, over the top. You know, you know this song from Nena from the nineties, ninety-nine yes, red I balloons. It. I, I always thought remember. I never thought that that was a prophecy. <laughs> right. No, I know. Um, I mean it's, we we still live in a system and we we sort of downplay the whole idea of unipolarity, hegemony, and hege- hegemony. It's just the reality is that still is a very dominant part of our system. I think we so. May- use those buzzwords so much anymore. We may not feel comfortable talking about them openly over a microphone, but you can absolutely see that we believe, for better or worse, for good or bad, we believe this global system works better with a dominant hegemonic order that is occupied by the United States uh, as an authority. Of and course. Yeah. That's, that's what we want. That's what we wish to push. And we don't see any kind of competitors that we think offer something better. Yeah. And that's going to just keep keep happening. You know, they, somebody pointed this out that the um, the phrase, the um liberal international order and also um um rules the rules based international order, these two very yeah. popular um phrases in the West are not part of international law. International law never doesn't have these concepts. Um, it's 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 a it's a very it's a very clear um, kind of imposition of norms that's coming from the West. And somebody translated those. I forgot who it was. But the um, um, uh, rules rules based international order means an, right. a world in which the West makes the rules and everybody else is ordered to follow. And yeah. I, that's the... not a bad translation. I'm, I'm I'm dating myself a little bit. I can't believe I'm already dating myself by quoting. Uh, if you remember the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, yes, uh, it was brilliant. Brilliant. the Curse of the Black Pearl. Mm-hmm. I've used in my classes for students when we're talking about realism, uh, order, rules based systems, yeah. international yeah. law. Yeah. I, I, use I it said, too. Do you remember the scene? I was like, Do you remember the scene when Elizabeth uh, shouts out parlay? Yes, because she wants to see Captain Barbosa. And the pirates take her, take her to Captain Barbosa. She's thinking because she said parlay, she gets to have a negotiation with him. And he basically listens to her and then just does exactly what he wants, which is the opposite of what she wants. And she's like, wait, 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 what a minute. What about the code? You, I, what about the code? And, she, and, and Barbosa looks at her and just says, well, first of all, you're not a pirate. The code and, doesn't and, apply to you. Mm-hmm. And second of all, and second of all, it, the code is really more like guidelines. And I've always told my students, without really any sense of irony or pessimism, I'm saying if you want to understand international law, the rules-based system of the global order, just watch that scene, and you'll understand that Captain Barbosa is the United States. <laughs> I I use I use exactly that scene, and I cut it together for my for my students. It's absolutely brilliant, but it also shows the force of norms, and it shows that Barbosa does not want to be seen as somebody who breaks the code because he also said we must honor the code, right? <laughs> and everybody does. Right. China does, Russia does. That's what gives me some hope for the code. Um, but the, the fact that everybody tur- turns it and twists it around and actually tries to define it. I see the rules-based international order as the US try- and the West trying to define what international law means. I see the South China Sea, the nine-dash line that China puts there. I see that as their attempt to try to define 
how how this Absolutely. code works. And the, these forces are in, in contest with each other. Funnily enough, Russia doesn't really try to do any of those. They, the Russians are trying to imitate what the West already did, you know, with Kosovo, with, with Syria and so on. They repeat this. They don't try to define their own um, system, but... Um, we are in a competition. Yes, that's a big, norm competition. Honestly, that, that's the basis of a great new book, actually, to wonder what, why is there a lack of military innovation strategy amongst the Russians? Because it, it has hurt them. It, it, it does. Um, Matthew, we are <laughs> running out of time. I thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting conversation with you. And Absolutely. I hope to talk to you soon again. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Pascal.